Welcome to Packets and Bolts, podcast about technology, life, philosophy, and everything in between. It is Wednesday, July 24th, 2024. This is your host, Muskrat. And today I talked to Lee Camp about the left, or lack thereof, in America. Mongoose and Dub Stench cannot make it today, but this Friday is sysadmin day, so look forward to that coming up in just a couple days. Remember to email the show at packetsandbolts at gmail.com. Packetsandbolts at gmail.com. All right. Well, Lee Camp is a comedian, activist, and commentator. He created, wrote, and hosted the hit weekly comedy show Redacted Tonight for eight years. He now hosts the daily show Dangerous Ideas on YouTube and Rumble. He's the author of multiple books, including Bullet Points and Punchlines and Dangerous Ideas. He also has multiple comedy albums and hosts the podcasts The Lee Camp Show, Moments of Clarity, and Government Secrets. Visit his website at leecamp.com. All right, welcome uh, Lee Camp to the Packets and Bolts. Uh, I'm a big fan. I followed you on Redacted Tonight until I magically didn't see it anymore. How are you doing? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, some recent conversations we've had on the show with regards to the politics in America and the influence of the left and the radical left and um, some opinion that, that the you know, radical left has taken over the Democratic Party. Uh, my personal belief that we don't have a, a real left. And I was wondering, uh, to pose this first question to you, uh, Mr. Camp, uh, the media talks about the radical left all the time. Uh, what What is the radical left in America? I mean, honestly, well, first of all, I don't think the media does. I think Fox News and OAN do, uh, you know, some of these uh, far-right media. But... Uh, I would love to see any evidence whatsoever that an actual left wing not just has taken over the Democratic Party, but has any sway whatsoever over the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, and we'll get back to the radical left idea in a second, but the Democratic Party is not left. People who think it's left wing don't understand anything about American politics or maybe world politics. But the Democratic Party in most countries if it were in that country, would be considered a right wing, but maybe towards center right, uh, if you're being generous. The Democratic Party is not left wing, and people, again, who call it left wing or call certain media left wing, like CNN or whatever, uh, I, I don't even know how to answer them other than just to say that they're completely ignorant of what left wing means. None of the things I'm mentioning, the mainstream Democrats, almost the entirety of Democrats in Congress, uh, almost the entirety of our, our media personalities that are, you know, at kind of the top of the media echelon are in any way anti-war anti-capitalism. Uh, they, they don't actually stand for doing anything to protect the environment. They just maybe stand for saying something about it here and there, but they're not actually, there's no action to back that up. So on the biggest, in the biggest areas, in the core beliefs of this country, there is no left uh, or left-wing ideals. In order to be truly left-wing, in my view, you need to be anti-capitalist. You need to be anti-war. Uh, at least largely. And again, you see zero of that in our Congress, in our presidency. Um, there, there's, there's, there's just zero. So the idea that somehow the radical left has taken over. Now, I guess what Fox News or, you know, maybe your colleague or someone would point to if they were really pressed is to show that the left wing has taken over the Democratic Party or uh, some portion of politics in America. All they would, I, I assume, have to point to is they'd either point, either point to something that's false. So they'd say, oh, look at the open borders. In fact, Reuters and many other outlets have just reported that Biden is deporting more people than Trump ever did. So the open borders thing is just a made up idea. So then if they're not pointing to something that's false, they'll point to, uh, you know, kind of these woke so-called ideas of like, well, look, there's a black woman as the press correspondent or there's a black woman actually running for president uh, now with Kamala Harris. Well, those are just things on the front. Those are just facade things. Those don't actually equal leftist ideals. Uh, they're just 
if you can find a, I mean, you can find plenty of black women across this country who stand for pro-war, who stand for Israel's genocide being perpetrated against Palestinians, who stand for all of these far-right, egregious, you know, Wall Street running wild, uh, enriching the billionaires to some crazy level while the average people across America get poorer and poorer. So just because you have a black woman or a gay person, you know, Pete Buttigieg or something in these positions, it means nothing in terms of actually being left wing, uh, in terms of actually pulling any of the uh, actual policies of this country to the left. So, you know, wokeism, quote unquote, is often used to actually cover the war crimes and cover the crimes of our ruling elite. So that doesn't equal uh, leftist ideas. You know, you, 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 you can tell that these people who claim that left ideas have taken over the government have nothing because they have to point to tiny little things. They have to point to, oh, a trans story time uh, took place in Chicago. <laughs> like, like right, if you have right. to point to that, then you have lost the thread. You you have nothing else to point to. Yeah, so you, you mentioned wokeism, and uh, I guess we can go a little bit, if you want, into the history of woke, where originally it just meant um, realizing that you were being oppressed by, you know, the the people that actually run society, and now it's turned into basically any of their boogeymen. Um, do you think the shift in identity politics, which I, I feel personally that the Democratic Party seems to focus on, do you think that was done not just on purpose to drive the discussion that way, but to distract from any other potential left-wing attack. So I think even Bernie Sanders once said that uh, focusing on uh, identity politics was bad, and they almost immediately jumped on him for, so you don't support equal rights for women and, and things like that. Do you think that's part of the strategy? Well, I think part of the strategy is to confuse everyone by just using terms like identity politics. Identity politics, uh, you know, as you're mentioning, can be, uh, you know, a false a false road to go down. If every every time you try and discuss anything, someone goes, uh, "This needs to be said by a black woman," or this, uh, you know, unless you have a trans person in your group, you're not allowed to speak. It can be used to to sideline any change or any discussion. So in that way. Identity politics can be very bad. Uh, but to just group everything under that umbrella of identity politics means, oh, okay, so we can't talk about racism in this country anymore. You can't talk about the fact that this is the largest prison state in the world and that it is, by the numbers, very, very racist. Uh, so to just use this umbrella term identity politics to sideline every conversation, it's to me, it's, all, it's borderline meaningless to just say identity politics. Sure. All right. Well, you've, you've pointed out some uh, flaws in the left-wing agenda idea of America, but what about, the critics would say, California, Seattle, San Francisco, these are the home of the radical left that have taken over the cities. Crime is at an all-time high. Homelessness runs rampant, probably because they want to get rid of capitalism or something. What do you say to that? Well, I guess you'd have to pick apart what the things are you're, you're most upset about. Well, so let's look at homelessness. Well, we know that homelessness is not caused by left-wing ideals or anything. Homelessness is caused, caused by this gut-wrenching capitalist system that churns people up and spits them out. And you have 61%, I think it is, of Americans who are living paycheck to paycheck, meaning they're on the cusp of homelessness at any given time. You have something like 66%, uh, you know, both of them are in the 60s, uh, of Americans can't afford a house no matter where they live. Um, so, that is the system that is creating this homelessness. Now, some of them may choose to go and live in certain cities in California because the weather's a little nicer and for a variety of other reasons, but that is not what created the homeless. And many people, you know, the studies show that many homeless, perhaps 50% are mentally ill, which also points to a society that does not actually care for mentally ill uh, in appropriate ways. We don't send people the help they need. And believe it or not, there are answers to homelessness that would solve it, essentially solve it, all but solve it. And guess what? We've even tried them across America. What? In <laughs> fact, in Utah... Uh, I can't remember what year it started, maybe 2015 or something. They tried something, and it was crazy. You know what they did? They gave every chronically homeless person an apartment and a caseworker. And guess what? The city saved, the, the state saved money because it cost less to give them a small apartment and caseworker than it did to deal with homelessness and all the emergencies and the emergency uh, personnel needed, et cetera. But on top of that, 
It eliminated 95% of homelessness. 95% of chronically homelessness disappeared. Now, they have since done away with that policy. Why did they do away with it? Because it was working. And we can't have that in America. We can't have the homeless having homes. So instead, I, instead we, we, do the, we, we do this insanity, which is, oh, well, we're going to pass laws saying homeless people need to go away, that we could arrest you for sleeping in public. Well, if they can't sleep in public and they don't own any private, where exactly are they supposed to sleep? Uh, it's just, it, it's heartless and gut-wrenching and disgusting the way we treat homeless people, especially in a country that has 17 million vacant homes. Millions upon millions of vacant homes litter our landscapes, and homeless people are not allowed to use any of them. We have roughly a million, maybe less, of homeless people. You could give every homeless person 17 homes and not run out. Uh, and, and here, I got a compromise. Rather than give every homeless person 17 homes, how about we just agree on one? <laughs> how about we agree on we give them one? Yeah. That- uh, so th- this idea that it's somehow left-wing policy that created homelessness is just, again, I don't. it comes from mass ignorance and it comes from uh, epic levels of propaganda pushed out by Fox News and others. Uh, you know, and to go back to the open borders thing, like I said, Joe Biden's deporting and, and, and uh, you know, ruining the lives of more refugees than Trump did, was able to in his four years. Uh, now, of course, he, Trump would love to. So it's not that Trump is, doesn't seek to do that. <laughs> uh, so this is not left wing policies. There is no open border. And if you want to really talk about immigration, why? Why are these people, many of them Latin American, coming mm-hmm. to the United States? Is it because we're so just wonderful or is it because the United States has like systematically go through the history, systematically destroyed so many countries in Latin America. Every time they have a democratically elected leader that actually wants to help their people, the U S the CIA through various means goes in there and does gut wrenching, uh, you know, efforts to destroy these countries, put in dictators, put in right wing lunatics, right? Like right now in Argentina, um, and and then these people flee because or a certain percentage of them flee because their country is e- economically destroyed. We also have economic war against many of these countries that have not been CIA coup or assassinated. So it's like and then and then when these people try and find a better life for themselves, we go, all oh, these horrible immigrants are coming to the, to the United States What's wrong with them. <laughs> well, the the other thing about that is, is it curious that no one ever enforces the hiring of the illegal immigrants? And whenever people bring it yeah. up, it's shot down pretty quickly. Yeah, because the corporations, many of them need that workforce. They need the immigrants, uh, many of them undocumented, many of them not undocumented, but they need immigrants to allow any manufacturing and other work to farming to continue in the United States. So the U.S. government, which is part and partial to the corporate, to the corporate America is not going to do anything to go after the hiring of these people because that would harm corporate America. Instead, they just want to attack the people as they come into the country. Let's also remember that we are a nation of immigrants from our founding. Uh, the, the estimates are that every year throughout the entire history of the United States, we've had between 10 and 15 percent of our population has been recent immigrants. So and that has not changed. It's not like we have a million percent now and we had 10 percent 40 years ago. It's always been roughly 10 to 50 percent. The difference is uh, through many of those years, a lot of those immigrants were white. Now, that didn't stop us, uh, you know, back in those days from hating those immigrants, the hatred towards Irish, the hatred towards Italians. But now that hatred has shifted towards towards Latin Americans and those who are not white skinned uh, and, you know, and just look at the numbers of Ukrainians that are allowed to immigrate here versus the numbers of many other countries or African countries. So it is, it is a racist policy. Much of these policies are racist at their heart. Um, and again, it's very nice to see that Kamala Harris was in charge of some of these policies. It's nice to see a black woman in charge of, uh, you know, destroying the lives of people of color. <laughs> well, you got to have equal opportunity, correct? Um, yep. All right. So when Utah was implementing that policy you spoke of of the House, would that have been considered communist or radical left? 
I mean, first of all, I know radical is supposed to be a negative term in our <laughs> in our propaganda now, but I view radical as, as pretty awesome. You know, the most radical left people I, I speak to are, are anti-war, like actually anti-war. They're anti-genocide in Gaza right now. They actually want to help people. They want to help those who are struggling, which this country is about, uh, enriching a tiny handful of people at the, at the expense of millions and millions of people. So... Uh, you know, radical left uh, people sound when you actually talk to them sound pretty nice to me. But anyway, uh, <laughs> back to Utah. Um, well, I, I guess this gets into the definition of socialist, which, you know, I'm I'm no expert, but a lot of people misuse it, or the way we use it has transferred over time. So you can have all those linguistic debates. Uh, uh, people can free, feel free to have those. But you know, the real like. Uh, original term for socialism had to do with uh, workers owning the means of production and et cetera. But nowadays we use socialist often to mean anything that's kind of paid for by the state, uh, which would mean social security. It would mean firefighters. It would mean police. It would mean roads. Guess what? The largest socialist organization in the in the world just about or well it's definitely in the united states is our military and if you're talking about amount of money going towards it it's the largest in the world the largest source socialist organization in the world going by sheer amount of money and bases around the world is the u.s military so if you uh if you these people who's radical left's taking over well get rid of the military and then we'll talk all right if you really <laughs> want to get rid of all these socialist ideas if we're using socialist to mean paid for by the government. So, you know, it's a com the reason people misunderstand this stuff and it's a combination of propaganda and ignorance. And, you know, if you give someone, if you give someone an apartment who's struggling, who's chronically homeless and, and guess what? The, 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 according to most studies, most people are homeless due originally due to life events, not because they're just love being homeless or they're just lazy. It's because their life is different than many other people in that they didn't have a support network. Perhaps they're mentally ill. Uh, perhaps they have PTSD, uh, a, a whole assortment of things. If you or I, uh, you know, and many, people around this country, if we lose our job, we're not immediately out on the street. Many of us have family. Many of us have family that may loan us money. Many of us have family that may say, you know what, sleep on your, our couch for a year or sleep in the guest room. How about that? Because in the guest room for a year until you get back on your feet. Yeah, well, some people don't have that. And the fact that they don't have that doesn't make them lazier or crazier. It's just we're lucky. Like, instead of coming from a place of privilege where you lose your job, you're not on the street, or you get some, uh, you know, catastrophic, uh, you know, let's say uh, some, uh, some illness where you have to go in the hospital and then you lose your life savings paying for that, et cetera, uh, and you're not on the street, don't look at that as now I need to turn around and go after all the homeless people. Look at it as, wow, I'm privileged. Boy, I should help the others who are not as privileged as I am. And to me, it's just amazing that the propaganda has been so successful as to get people to punch down in their ideologies just constantly. Yeah, we'll we'll get to some. Uh, I have a question on how you think we got here, but uh, two two countries. Okay, we're told uh, Cuba, crazy left wing, and it's so left wing that that's why it's a failed state. Meanwhile, China. Uh, supposedly communist, but we hear some people say it's succeeding because of capitalism. So what is up with the two dichotomies there? Uh, I mean, I think that analysis is, uh, is a bit too reductive. So I don't know why you're calling Cuba failed state. Uh, <laughs> That's I, just what people say. I'm I, just saying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not me personally. <laughs> uh, I've been to Cuba. It's an amazing com uh, country. And, it, you know, yeah, there are complaints about Cuba by Cubans, which I think is probably just about every country in this world. I don't really know of one where there's nobody who complains about what goes on in their country. But um, but you look at Cuba and there is a lot of happiness there. They're, like Cuba has guaranteed they, they have free medical care. They have free education. They have uh uh, guaranteed employment. So if you don't have a job, you can get one. Um, and, and they have uh, guaranteed housing. Um, so there's essentially zero homelessness. There's essentially zero people that are, you know, uh, completely destitute. 
Now, again, this doesn't mean everyone loves Cuba. There are Cubans who don't like their their government or their country. But to call it a failed state is just kind of propaganda. Uh, Mm -hmm. Cuba also has been able to achieve this, meaning a largely functioning, largely fine country with a medical system that's better than the United States with a mortality rate, uh, you know, length of uh, life that is now higher than the United States. People live longer in Cuba than they live in the U.S. Uh, They're able to achieve all this despite the fact that the U.S. has had a massive gut-wrenching economic war on them for decades and decades ever since they threw off their U.S. empire chains, and that has always pissed us off. So to be able to achieve all this, despite the economic blockade, which if you look at the U.N., the only countries in the world that still believe that Cuba should have an economic embargo on it, should have this economic war against it, is the United States. And then, you know, Ukraine votes with the United States because they need (laughs) our money, and Israel sometimes does. But so every country in the world, essentially, except for the U.S., says, why not let Cuba have economic trading partners and work with other countries. And the U.S. has worked steadfastly to, for decades to crush Cuba. And yet still, Cuba's largely doing fine. So when mm-hmm. people say, oh, look, when people say, oh, look how bad Cuba is, even for the things that are bad in Cuba right. uh, or more difficult in Cuba, it's due to the U.S. economic war. The U.S. is able to tell just about every country in the world except China, Russia, Iran, and Venezuela to not get anywhere near Cuba, to not right. do any trading with them, to not give any resources to them, to not work with them. So uh, I, I think anything, any difficulty Cuba is having is due to that, is due to the economic war on them. Yeah, and I'm obviously throwing straw men at you here, but uh, the, that this is the this is serious things that people actually say. Uh, I I knew someone that uh, went to visit during the Obama period of a little bit better travel, mm-hmm. um, and uh, when he came back, he said, uh, "You can tell how capu- uh, communism really doesn't work." And I brought up the sanction thing, but he didn't. He he, said, he talked about how poor everything everyone was and stuff. <laughs> um, I didn't. Yeah, I. I well, I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> what he's. I'm wondering what he saw because I didn't see poor people. I saw. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you. If you come from like a U.S. Mick mansion and that's what you're <laughs> used to is like is like these giant sparkling clean sterile 42 room <laughs> houses, then I guess you would look at like somebody living happily in an apartment and you'd go, oh, my God, look at the poverty. Right. Uh, but, you know, that's just if you if you fall in so aggressively for the propaganda, then, you know, you're kind of beyond saving. Yeah. Funny thing about McMansions is they're usually built with really horrible quality. So what about <laughs> China? The Chinese are supposedly communist, but yet they succeed because of capitalism. At least that is an argument that capitalists like to make. What do you make of that? They are a mixture between capitalism and communism, and they're a better economist to, since I'm not an economist, to speak to about this. But uh, I will say that some of their success has been due to market economics. But again, it depends on how you dis- how you. Uh, decide success. Uh, many of the people you're probably quoting in your straw man arguments is uh, they're they're probably viewing success as who has the most money, who built the <laughs> biggest thing, mm. who has the richest people. I view success for humanity as hu- who has the least people destitute, who has the least people that are hungry every night, who has the least people that are dying from unclean water, the number one cause of death around this world. Like, to me, that is success. That is winning. Uh, who has the best communities where people feel they really have a community and they have uh, friends and family that can that, that, that love them and they can work with? And who has the best, uh, you know, uh, system where people have have passion in their in their jobs in their lives like to me that's success to others it's how many diamonds on the chain around your neck and to those people who you know say well cuba doesn't have a lot of diamonds on the chains around their neck uh, some of them don't even have chains around their neck at all uh, that they could that they got from the jewelry store well then you don't understand what life is about and you know the, again that's that's a tougher argument to discuss because you got to break down who the person is to begin with um but so sure. to go back to China, yeah, some of the some of the GDP success, China, you know, uh, along with BRICS, is now their GDP is above that of the G7. Uh, the U.S. is on the decline. The U.S. is a waning empire. Uh, some of China's success has to do with 
uh, the mar market economics are, are, you know, connected to some levels of capitalism. But if you look at the way China plans, which I don't know that you have to call it communist, but I, I think you could call it uh, uh, socialist or you could call it uh, putting the people over profit. China will plan things for a decade or, or sometimes two decades out. The U.S. and capitalist, truly unfettered capitalist countries have no way of planning that far out. Instead, all planning by the United States is done by corporate America, and it's mm. all at most how <laughs> to get the most. Yeah, yeah, per quarter usually, like per fiscal quarter, but at most a year or two ahead mm -hmm. uh, is about how to make the most money a year or two ahead. China will make decisions on how to get the most people out of extreme poverty. And this story, and anybody can look this up if they think I'm making up facts, they can look it up. It's been in the New York Times. It's been in all the mainstream media. They don't like to talk about it a lot. But China has taken 850 million people out of extreme poverty over the past 30 years. 850 million people. And that was not due to capitalism. That was due to China deciding we're going to put the money and the effort and the planning into getting 850 million people out of extreme poverty. And they did it. And if you look at the, the actual growth of humanity around the globe out of people coming out of poverty, Poverty, like the vast majority of it is just China. So when people say, hey, look, capitalism works, we're in a capitalist world and people are out of poverty or extreme poverty, uh, most of that was actually China. <laughs> so, right. yeah, it, it, this is these are things that the U.S. capitalists don't really want to talk about. But that is a crazy achievement. That is more than double the population of the United States being taken out of extreme poverty. It's, it's really unbelievable. Yeah. And that's, again, due to long-term planning and due to planning that is not just about money over people. Uh, the U.S. W essentially plans everything on money over people because it because we live in an inverted totalitarian system ruled by the anonymous corporate state uh, as uh, that concept was originated with political philosopher Shel Sheldon Wolin. And... That's what we live in. So at the end of the day, it is these anonymous corporate state entities that make the decisions for the United States. It's not the two clowns, the two uh, ass clowns, if you want technical terminology, that actually are running for president right now. Um, it, it is instead <laughs> these massive entities that are far more wealthy and powerful than the ass clowns. As George Galloway calls them, uh, two cheeks of the same uh, behind, I believe. And I think you uh, recently spoke with them. Um, so for the, the uh, one quick comment on the uh, current economic war that it looks like we're waging or attempting to wage on, on China, um, I, I always found it ironic that we spent years moving all of our manufacturing over to them, giving them the ability to overtake us, only now to be concerned possibly that they're overtaking us. Um, feel free to, to comment on that or not, but back to the last, yeah, yeah. To the last uh, topic quick, um, uh, you mentioned propaganda and how successful it is, and it, it's there's probably whole, you know, Noam Chomsky uh, manufacturing consent, et cetera. But was FDR, uh, was he, can would he be considered left in your, in your view? Would he be considered extreme left um, or not, neither? Would he just be centrist? And was the Red Scare the, what really set the dominoes in order to get us to where we are today? Okay, let me, uh, let's see, tackle those by order. Um so the yeah the China manufacturing I'll just say real quick because there's more to talk about but uh yeah that that's actually a good example of the U.S. corporations doing exactly whatever made them the most money for a time making them the most money was to uh, get rid of all American workers that they could send all of the manufacturing over to China where the where people were working for equivalent uh, the equivalent to see of you know pennies for the dollar. And, you know, that's gotten a lot better. Most Chinese do not work for that small amount now. But uh, but we send all the manufacturing. These U.S. corporations, while they're doing that, do not care. They may have said they did here and there, but do not care at all about the millions of jobs, U.S. jobs that they were eliminating as they do that. Because at the end of the day, and at the end of the day, there is no concern for the worker in capitalism. There is zero it, there is nothing in the equation, in the equation for GDP, in the equation for how a capitalist system works. There is nothing in the equation that says, 
Are your workers happy? Do they feel good? Do they do they think you're treating them right? Instead, and it may they may give some uh, you know some little talking points to that, you know, throw out a little lip service to that here and there. But if you actually look over a scale of five to 10 years, they're going to eliminate whatever jobs they can. They're going to get the workers to work for as little as they can. That is always the case. And that was the case with sending so many jobs to China. Now, once China became a more powerful country economically, the U.S. corporate state has gotten a little worried that the U.S. empire is in decline, Chinese uh, are in the ascent. And so now there's a bunch of, you know, hollering about, uh, you know, let's let's stop uh, shipping all our jobs over there. But then the U.S. capitalist system won't bring them back to American workers. Instead, they'll move those. Instead, they'll move that labor source to Vietnam or to some mm. other country that is Bangladesh that will work for pennies on the dollar. And just to remind everyone how egregious this uh, garbage is, the average. You know, I looked. I I haven't looked this up for five years, so maybe it's changed slightly. But the average Bangladeshi sweatshop worker that makes a shirt that you buy on Amazon makes in a year what Jeff Bezos makes in about a minute. Uh, it, it is utterly insane. But anyway, the, the point is corporate America is not going to bring those jobs home. Instead, they'll shift them to another country where people mm -hmm. can work, people work for pennies. Okay, so FDR. Um, was FDR left? Uh, I, I'd say that some of the things he did were left-wing and... You know, mainly people point to the New Deal. Um, but I, I think people need to remember that at FDR, yes, he wanted the New Deal, but he was able to achieve much of the New Deal because of the union, the power of the unions, the power of the workers, and the power of some sort of left wing in America that actually did have sway back then and was actually able to force FDR in order force FDR to pass those things, slight protections for workers, social security, uh, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and things like that. Uh, it, but, th but that was done. I would not call him far left because that was done to save capitalism. It was done to save the capitalist structure, uh, which it largely did. It allowed it to continue uh, pretty successfully for many decades uh, by giving workers these slight things and i call them slight because you're still you know giving away your 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 labor and your life force for often 50 years of your the prime of your life to a corporate power that enriches themselves to some egregious level with we now have a thousand billionaires or whatever it is in this country um so i wouldn't call him far left at all i'd call him some of his policies left wing uh there were also amazing people behind him who pushed those policies into play uh, but now we see the gravity of capitalism eroding that new deal at every level, even to the now having the discussion about how some people want to get rid of Social Security. Um, they've they've eroded workers' rights. They're eroding child labor laws, which we now see multiple states are allowing children to get back into the workforce. Uh, all of those protections are being gutted. So that's funny. If this if this government and this uh, nation is run by the radical left, why are all those things getting gutted? Huh? Interesting that. Um, if it's run by the radical left, why can't anyone get a $15 federal minimum wage in this country, which is such a, you know, basic level of, uh, of, of dignity for workers. Um, and then you had some, uh, oh, the red scare. Uh, so yeah, the, the uh, I, I don't know whether the red scare is responsible for fully for where we are now, but the red scare was part of the large scale, uh, war between the capitalist states and the communist states. Um, and so they therefore, because, because communism, I mean, communism is worker based, but if you look at most of the communist structures, you know, with Stalin and everything that, that is, if you have a, a authoritarian structure, that's not worker based. That's, you know, they may claim to be for the workers, but it's sure. an authoritarian structure. Anyway, that aside, um, 
the Red Scare was part of a larger war between capitalism and communism, which was why we went and utterly destroyed Vietnam, killing millions of people, was because they were becoming communist. Uh, it's it's the, the Korean War. Uh, it's actually largely why we dropped the atomic bombs, even though Japan was, you know, was on the cusp of surrender and actually had said they would surrender as long as we let them keep their emperor. Um, and... And we dropped the atomic bombs basically to show to the Soviet Union, despite them, quote unquote, being our allies in World War II, to show the Soviet Union that we had the atomic bombs and that we're not afraid to use them. Um, but anyway, so then that battle of the capitalist titans versus the workers is also uh, happening within the U.S. And it is used to go after anyone who dare uh be a part of many of these uh, worker groups or support them. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's all part of the same battle, which has, uh, has now led to, uh, I think we're seeing the environmental destruction of the world and possibly no future for humanity. If it continues, I mean, it's not just climate crisis. It's we're cutting down all the trees. We're filling the oceans with plastic. We're de destroy, you know, all the insects are disappearing. So, if this is capitalism, then uh, then it's not it's not long for this world, nor are we. <laughs> well, on that bright note, I think I threw I don't know twenty fifty strawmen <laughs> at you. I think they lie in ashes. Anything else that you wanted to add as we end it here? <laughs> no, thank you for that. I I, I wasn't expecting uh, such a deep economics uh, debate, but uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, if people, I mean, maybe you were going to say this, if people want to follow my stuff and most of my stuff is, is fairly comedic, although most of this was not, but, um, I, I do comedy and I also do a lot of uh, political analysis and it's, uh, I live stream daily. Uh, my show is called dangerous ideas on YouTube and rumble. And my name is Lee camp and people can find my stuff at leecamp.com or on my link tree. I have podcasts, I have books. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll definitely link to it in the show notes. Thanks again for joining the show. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, those chimes are coming. And uh, it was great sitting down with Lee talking about the left. But what do you think? Do you think the radical left has taken over or we have no left? Remember to keep packing the uh, bolts. Until next time, see ya. Real goat. Hey!